Hey guys, and welcome to another solo mini series. It's been a little while since we've done one of these. I know you guys have been uh, commenting, wanting some more trip videos. So here one is. I'm very excited about today's as well because I'm getting to check out a region of WA that I've never seen before. I've always uh, had it on the list, but I seem to always kind of just miss it going either north or south. So hopefully my pronunciation is correct, but I'm off to explore the Dontracasto National Park. I'll put some text on the screen because it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful. I've been trying to wrap my head around the pronunciation all week. Amazing region of WA. Way, uh, based on what I've seen online. Some of the most amazing sand dunes you'll ever see, some awesome coastlines, some cliffs, nice beaches, dense kind of foresty bushland to explore, and the occasional water crossing thrown in as well, so it has got it all. This spot I'm camping in right now is called the Rooney's Bridge Forward Drive Camp Zone. I just found it on Wiki Camps. It's a free camp, yeah, just south of Manjimup, just off the uh, Southwest Highway. It's kind of just far enough that I could still hear cars and traffic going by on that Southwest Highway, but not so loud that it kept me awake, so pretty good. Super a nice campground it is a weekend so it's relatively busy and as with all these free camps there's rubbish all over the place i've already done one clean up this morning uh in this area i'm camped in and I've, there's some more around here i'll probably pick up before i head off as well anyway i'm excited it's the weekend got a brand new place to explore what more could you want really so i reckon i'm going to pull this tent down pack the car away and get on the road So if you're not a WA local, the chances are you've never heard of this Don Tricasto National Park. Again, I'm probably pronouncing that completely wrong. Essentially, it's a very skinny national park that stretches up the coast of the southwest of WA, kind of around the Windy Harbour area. It's not a massive national park, but there's certainly a lot to see within it. Probably too much for me to see in a weekend. So my rough plan is to split it in half around Windy Harbour. That's pretty much the, uh, the halfway point if you split up the north half and the south half. I'm just gonna do the south half for this, uh, these few days. There's a couple of places I've been wanting to check out in that southern side of things, but there is a hell of a lot in the northern half as well so no doubt in the next uh, I don't know the next few months Bianca and I will both come back and explore the uh, the northern side of the Don Tricasto National Park including Yeager Up Dunes and Cowcup Hill if you're a local you know all about that hill and I'm very keen to see if the mighty D-Max can uh, conquer that beast but on my way to Windy Harbour this morning that's where I'm going to be kicking off my uh, exploration of this area I'm going to start Windy Harbour and then work my way south from there I am just gonna stop off on one little attraction to explore my way in, which looks pretty fun, but you guys will see that when I get there. So that behind me is Moon's Crossing, which is a fun little water crossing in this region. It's a nice firm rock base underneath, so no dramas getting across, particularly now because it's almost completely dry, which I expected. We've just come out of the warmer summer months, so all these crossings are looking pretty dry at the moment, but it's a perfect time to come and check them out. Come back here in winter, it's a, it's a fair bit of a different story. Plenty of water running through there, so a bit of a different beast to tackle. Also with crossings like this, it is really important to get out and check them out before you attempt them. Even if you think 
there's not much water and it's a pretty firm base. You never know though when there might be some huge uh, holes hidden beneath that water surface. So get out, go for a walk, have a look, walk through it if you can't see the bottom to make sure you're not going to drown your vehicle and happy days. Anyway, I just wanted to pull off quickly to check that out. As I said, I've never seen it before, but uh, I was keen to stop off and have a look. But back on the road now to continue my journey. I was gonna say we're running a bit behind schedule, but this is a lovely weekend camping trip, so there is no schedule to stick to, except for a uh, lunchtime schedule, because I'm getting pretty hungry. But only about half an hour away from Windy Harbour, which is uh, all bitumized on the journey there. I'll have a bit of lunch there and check out uh, one or two of the touristy attractions in the area. So I'm just cruising through what seems to be the main town of Windy Harbour, and it's so cool. It's essentially like a collection of shacks, uh, and it's almost like, like a small fishing village, I suppose you'd call it, but I tell you what, some of these buildings around here, you could not call them shacks. I saw one that was like three stories tall. So, you know, just triple the size of my house at home, and it's just in this little uh, fishing village type situation. Really cool, everyone's uh, seems friendly from waves and whatnot. A lot of families down here just trying to make the most of the weekend, which is awesome to see. But yeah, very cool place. Well, it is a very windy day down at Windy Harbour. I suppose that's where it gets its name from. Uh, hopefully the audio is not too terrible. I put the microphone in its little wind sock, so fingers crossed it's all good. I've just pulled into Point Don Tricasto to go and check out a place called The Window. Uh, it's quite a touristy spot of the Windy Harbour region and apparently it's got some pretty nice views. So, brought the camera along and I figured while I'm in the area, may as well go and check it out. So here we are down at the window and I'm holding onto my camera very tightly because I thought it was windy up there, it's even more windy down here. So you can see why it gets its name, it's a nice natural window formation that lets you see straight down to the raging water beneath, a very cool view, I'm sure the camera's not going to do it justice so you just have to come down here and check it out for yourself. And it's only about a two minute walk from the car park anyway so nice easy one to check off the list. If you've never visited national parks before, you'll see these pay stations throughout the different uh, various areas. They're not to pay for parking, they're actually to pay for your entry into the national park. Hopefully it goes without say, but make sure you do actually pay your entry fees. But to do so, you've got two ways. You can use those uh, boxes to print your day pass. I think it's about $15 for the day entry, or you can jump online and purchase an annual pass you actually print out, chuck on your dashboard, it costs $120, that's what I did a few days ago. And that means for the next 12 months from date of purchase, I can access all the national parks. So it's about 2 p.m., so time for a late lunch. I'm absolutely starving. I always seem to leave my meal times a bit later when I'm camping. I figure this is a pretty nice backdrop to eat lunch to, so why not? The lunch I'm having is super simple. It's something I have almost every time I go away because it takes no time to prepare, and I want to be spending most of the day exploring anyway. So, I take a delicious bread roll, pre-cut, and then I buy this ready-cooked chicken from pretty much any supermarket. This is my peri-peri flavor, one of my favorites. Then we'll just chuck a bit of lettuce in there as well. Finish it off with a bit of aioli sauce. Check that out, just like the fancy restaurants, hey? Oh, I cannot wait to get this into me. I am absolutely starving. Oh, 
Alrighty, finished my lunch. That was absolutely delicious for something so simple. Always a winner. Now it's time to jump back onto the bitumen and head in a general southerly direction to go and explore the area down that way. I just had a kangaroo jump across the road in front of me, so I thought it was a good time to remind you guys to definitely keep an eye out for wildlife when you're traveling to remote areas like this. Uh, they're not just at sunset, it's only about 2.30 in the afternoon and they're already bouncing around. So it kind of was a nice reminder for me too to be more vigilant than I was being. And yeah, just a, it's a good thing for you guys to keep in mind as well because you can pretty, uh, pretty quickly ruin your car, ruin your trip, and also ruin a kangaroo. So definitely keep your eyes peeled. The tracks have started getting a little bit bumpy, which means the fun stuff is about to begin. So I've just pulled over to drop my tire pressures down to a more suitable PSI because we're still at full road pressure at the moment. Now, if I was just going to be staying on these kind of gravelly but bumpy surfaces, I'd probably drop down to around the 20 mark. But considering I know I'm going to end up on the beach, which I've heard is extremely soft, I'm going to go straight down to 15, which is my normal beach pressure. And I find that's low enough that I can... I can get through most beach situations without any trouble, but if I do start to bog down with 15, I've still got room to go lower if I need to. So that back there was the Gardner River Crossing, which is another fun one to explore. Right now it's pretty tame and the water is only, I don't know, at most maybe a foot deep. So not a problem at all, but trust me, you come back here in winter and that will be a completely different story. I've heard at times that river crossing is uh, impassable. There actually used to be a bridge, like a proper bridge that crossed the Gardner River a bit further along the track, but that's since been closed down. So now that river crossing is the only way across to this section of the track. So luckily it was nice and tame today because where I want to explore Floor is at this side of the track and I'm going to head down towards the beach now. The day is really getting on, it's getting close to 4.30, a bit later than I was expecting to be in this place but that's alright, I've been having a lot of fun exploring these tracks. So I'm going to make my way down to the beach, there's a few camping areas I want to check out. I tell you what, I might just be the luckiest man in the whole of the Dondrocasto National Park. 
I was uh, looking for a place to camp. The sun was just setting. I'm like, oh, starting to get a bit nervous that I wouldn't find a place. And I cruised down to Kudamara Beach because I wanted to check it out anyway. And there was a, uh, a few points I'd kind of pinned that I might like to camp. Got down there, blowing an absolute gale and both the sites I wanted to camp in were taken already, as you'd expect for a weekend. So I headed back off the beach and I'm cruising through these tracks and I just rounded a corner and I'm like, ooh, I wonder what's up that little, uh, little nook. Pulled up, the best campsite I've probably ever camped in unreal like places for extra cars if you want to put them nice and flat shelter from the wind which is very important nice and private and check this out got my own bloody park bench so the facilities are just top notch i am a very happy man got to keep pinching myself that uh, i'm actually not dreaming and i have found this perfect site and i'm just keen to get the tent set up and yeah start enjoying this afternoon and I'm probably going to get dinner started quite early as well because one roll just didn't quite cut it for lunch and I am starving. One thing I did want to show you guys on the drive-in, but it was a bit too busy for me to rush in there with my camera and poking around everywhere, is there's a place called Moore's Hut or Kudamarup Hut, depending on which mapping software you're using. It's about five minutes back on the track. You might have seen it as we drove through. Uh, essentially, it's like a bush hut that you're allowed to actually camp in or stay in. The original one was built back in the 1900s, I'm pretty sure, but that one then burnt down and they've actually rebuilt it and it looks quite modern and, uh, quite modern and fancy nowadays. So yeah, just worth keeping in mind if you're coming here with a family and you need a bit more real estate or the weather is going to be particularly bad uh, get here nice and early if you're coming on a weekend you'll have to get here really early to secure the hut but you can stay inside chuck your swags in there or stretch your beds or you can stay on the grounds kind of just outside the hut itself anyway you might get a chance to check it out on my drive out tomorrow but probably not likely those people look like they were pretty well set up for the whole weekend anyway time for me to go to get my camp set up and get some dinner underway because i am starving Welcome back to the kitchen for another episode of uh, Daniel Tries to Cook Camping Food. So tonight I'm making Spanish chorizo pasta, which is honestly my latest favorite camping meal for one main reason, and that's because we cook the entire dish in one frying pan. So no other pots and pans required, just this one dish, which makes cleanup an absolute breeze. So I've already chopped my ingredients, but basically all that goes into this is one stick of uh, chorizo sausage chopped into half moons like that, one onion diced nice and finely, some garlic, however much garlic you like. I've put about six cloves in mine because I am a fan of garlic. Then we just have one capsicum chopped up and also one zucchini chopped up, actually half a zucchini chopped up into half moons. Also, we have one tin of crushed tomatoes, um, actually diced tomatoes, but they're all pretty similar in my books. Two cups of vegetable stock and also some pasta of your choice. So I'm going with penne for mine. Other than that, you'll just need some salt and pepper to garnish it to taste and maybe some cheese as well. You can also chuck in some parsley if you feel like being particularly fancy, but I mean, we're camping, so I'm gonna leave the parsley out. So the first step is to flash up our frying pan, chuck in a bit of olive oil, 
and chuck in that chorizo first to get it cooking. So we only want to cook this for about two minutes just till it starts browning nicely on both sides. So mine's getting pretty close already. Also, if you wonder why I'm using a metal spoon, I've forgotten my plastic uh, stirring spoon. So I'm trying to be very gentle not to scratch my pan, but this is getting the job done. Alrighty, my chorizo is looking pretty good. So the next step is gonna be to literally add everything else that we've prepared earlier. So I'm gonna go in with that onion. Chuck that garlic in. The zucchini. And my capsicum as well. There we go, give that all a stir around. Mmm, there's some amazing smells coming out of this frying pan right now. Alrighty, so just gonna leave that to cook for about five minutes. Next thing to do is add our 400 grams of diced or chopped tomatoes. Then we're gonna add our two cups of vegetable stock as well. And that's gonna give us the liquid we need to cook that pasta. This is also where you find out if you've uh, parked your car on a level surface or not. Okay, give that a bit of a stir around and we're gonna bring this to the boil. I'm just gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper to mine at this stage as well. Once that liquid is pretty much boiling, we're gonna add some pasta, roughly two cups of pasta, but I normally just try and go for an even covering, like something like that. Kind of push the pasta down a bit so it's nice and evenly covered in the liquid, because that's what it's gonna be absorbing while it's cooking. There we go, turn the heat down to very, very low. And we're gonna leave that to simmer for about 10 minutes. So after about 10 minutes, what you wanna do is grab yourself a bit of pasta out and just see how cooked it is. Easiest way is by eating a bit. Mm. So mine's still a little bit chewy. It's getting close, but still quite chewy. So I'm just gonna give this a bit of a stir around and then I'll leave it for another five minutes. If you find your liquid's getting low, it's also a good time to chuck a lid on because that's gonna retain some of that pasta, um, some of that moisture rather. So it's been about an extra five minutes and my pasta is now cooked perfectly, nice and al dente, just the way I like it. I've gone ahead and added a bunch of cheese too to get it starting to, to melt through that pasta. If you wanna do the true authentic Spanish way, you put some manchego cheese, but I didn't have that, so it's just some uh, regular bagged grated cheese. Oh, there we go. It doesn't get much better than that. And what a fantastic way to end what was a pretty fantastic day. So I didn't quite get as much explored as I was hoping, but that's not too surprising when I'm pulling over every few meters to set up a camera or launch the drone. It's uh, kind of just the nature of the beast, but yeah, still had a really, really good day. So thank you guys so much for watching this episode. Tomorrow I'm gonna to be exploring a whole bunch more down further south, but as well as a few of the other bits and pieces I didn't quite get to today. So thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next episode of this series. So I'm gonna make my way. All the blurry. I think I've got something.